today we've been joined by a very special individual. She's a very popular figure in Sri Lanka. If I just talk about her in one sentence, she is the first ever Sri Lankan to qualify for an Olympic event in the sport of uh, horse riding, particularly in show jumping. And I'm very happy to welcome Matilda Carlson to the Sports Center on TV1. Thank you very much, Matilda, for accepting my invitation to feature on the show today. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Uh, if I ask you to explain all our viewers uh, the event that you're going to take part at the 2021 Olympics in Tokyo, how would you explain show jumping uh, to Sri Lankan who is kind of very less familiar in terms of the sport? Uh, well, we will um, challenge a competition with, um, with um, course with obstacles that we're gonna jump over. Yeah, and there's gonna be massive, big jumps, 160 high. They're gonna be taller than me, uh, the jumps that we need to face. Uh, and uh, we hope that we will make that as a clear round without hitting any poles. And uh, the thing, uh, my horse is definitely a horse that can jump plenty of clear rounds, plenty, plenty, plenty. He's very, he has no limits of how high he can jump. We are not the fastest, so that is going to be our challenge to train that and try to be stay focused to um, not make that come in our way. That it would be a shame if he jumped clear, he jumped good and strong, um, and because we wasn't fast enough, if we couldn't find get the final or the the results that we wanted. I kind of read an article about you stating that. Uh... Uh, you did not felt connected to Sri Lanka until the first time that you visited the country back in year 2018. Uh, can you tell me the reason why you first visited Sri Lanka? Well, you know, I, I was adopted away to Sweden when I was just a baby. I had no memories of the language, of the people, of the country, nothing. So for me growing up, obviously I look different from uh, Swedish people. But I felt very Swedish, you know, I had the best loving family I could imagine that just gave me the life that, um, you know, to make the best out of myself. I had all the opportunities to study, to become a, a show jumper, which was even for my Swedish family, to, totally cuckoo, um, you know. Uh, so no, I, I never really thought much about Sri Lanka and everyone was like, keep telling me, Oh, have you never been? Why don't you go back? And, and a lot of people said, oh, I just came from a super nice holiday. It's the most beautiful country. You have to go. I cannot believe you had never been. And then, um, yeah, I went to Singapore for, uh, I was going to celebrate New Year's Eve there. Um, and I didn't, you know, I didn't enjoy it so much. <laughs> and the weather was bad. And then my fiance said, you know what? Sri Lanka is not very far off from here. Why don't we go? And I was like, yeah, sure. But then I was in the plane and I was like, I having this feeling, you know, like I was like, oh my God, I gotta go back. And I don't know, like it, it was emotional. It was really, it was not, I, I don't say it was hard, but it was emotional. And I'm not really like that. No, like, honestly, like not just, I mean, people that I met, I, I, you know, the, just the mentality, everyone is just laughing, super helpful, loving, and such a nice atmosphere and in this beautiful country with the beaches and the animals, you know, I'm very much into all the animals, wild things, and I see the monkeys jumping around. It, it's just, it is amazing. And I didn't have much time at that time. Um, but um, what I saw was amazing. And I met incredible people that I still in very close contact to, if it's the family of um, that I met there. And then it was just natural for me to switch back to Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka after that. I felt very connected. I felt super, super proud to represent this beautiful country. Really, I, and I, I really thought, you know, the people that doesn't know where Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka is, they need to get to know this country. They need to be a mark on the, on the map where Sri Lanka is because this is one of the most beautiful countries in the world, definitely. And I have traveled a lot and I've never seen any beauty like this. 
So um, yeah, it felt natural. And then I did come back, that was 2017 and I switched then um, later on, it took a long time, you know, with all the paperwork and stuff. Then I switched back to Sri Lanka. And then um, luckily I, I came back for the beginning of 2020 again. Do, do you actually remember where were you born in Sri Lanka or any details? Uh, yeah, I know I was born in Kandy. That's uh, at least that's what's in my birth papers and stuff. So, yeah. You got the uh, approval or the, you were qualified to take part in the Olympics uh, in the year of 2020 at Tokyo and thereafter some of the competitions that were kind of uh, considered for Olympic qualifications were removed by the governing body and then you'll have to, you'd have to basically fight for it. Uh, can you kind of, you know, briefly explain me the sequence of events that kind of, you know, occurred there, Mathilda, from the time that uh, you got to know that these particular competitions were removed from the selection and there onwards? Um, well, yeah, in the beginning of um, January, the ranking came out, January 2020, the um, ranking came out and it showed that I had a second spot and um, that Sri Lanka qualified for the Olympic for 2020 in Tokyo. Um, and I was at that point actually on holiday in Sri Lanka and enjoying my time. And it was just amazing that I was just at that time, I was there to just celebrate with all of you guys. And there was just a hysterical, amazing time. And I enjoyed it so much. And it was, you know, purest pressure because, you know, we have worked so hard to get this done. I knew, I knew that I qualified already before because I had kept, of course, track of my rankings and my mid competitors and stuff. Uh, so I knew, but I wanted to wait to see that it was official made and all of this. And yeah, we did qualify. And, uh, but it, you know, this, this happiness didn't last for very long. Um, people told me already before they said, don't, don't be too euphoric yet, because this is the Olympics, you know, people are going to try everything they can to take this part away. And I was like, ah, oh, you know, <laughs> I didn't know better. I, I thought, okay, now I, you know, what's going to happen? But yes, indeed. And then this, the rumors already started before. I've, I heard the rumors that they said, no, ah, no, 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 your, your qualification wasn't legal. And I said, but why wouldn't they be legal? I mean, I didn't do anything wrong. And I did not do anything wrong. And obviously, I got it proved now. Um, but it was a hard time when the governing body, the FEI, when they decided to take the ranking points away from me, which mean, meant that I lost my, my Olympic dream, my, my spot for the Olympics and, and my whole team, you know, we were devastated because um, it was a fault that adding these ranking classes that was approved for Olympic rankings as well. Um, they were sent, obviously they were sent in two days too late, but they approved it anyway. They approved it nine times and if, French Federation, it was French shows um, in France, and the French Federation also approved in nine times. So, and that's something that me as a question, me as an athlete, me as a writer, I, even if I knew all the rules, which I actually, for the qualification, I didn't know all the rules, but you know, in general, all the rules, is no way that I could have known or could have seen this on the schedule. The only thing we get is the schedule with this, all the information that we need to know, all the classes, all the rules, everything. And it was not on there. There was stamped, approved nine times from the FEI, the governing body, and the um, French National Federation. So as an athlete, you need to trust this. If you can't trust the governing body, who are you going to trust? So, but okay, they all have loopholes. I know, you know, everyone wants this very heated spots for the Olympics. And um, the only the thing, I knew that I didn't do anything wrong. I knew that I would get this if I could just, the time was against me to get the get this done, but I knew if I could take it to cast the uh, sports um, judge or whatever, what you call it, I don't know, to take it to cast, I, I knew I would win it because I wasn't right and I knew it. Um, but the hard time was of course, People don't understand the sport. People don't understand. Uh, I mean, it's even difficult for people that do understand the sport to know what actually happened. 
And you you feel like people think you did something wrong, you cheated, or you 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 was criminal in some kind of way. You know, they put me out there in a light where I don't want to be. I'm I'm really I I knew all the rules. I followed everything. We did everything by the book. And then things like this happen. You know, I know there are loopholes, but we didn't go. We didn't do that. And and um. It just felt very, I felt very misunderstood and I felt very, it felt personal and it felt that I was misjudged from a lot of people and also people that is, was close to me um, because they didn't understand what actually happened and they just jumped to conclusions because just because the spot gets taken away, then you must have done something wrong. And it's very nice for me and for my whole team, you know, they put so much work into me and faith and believe in me. Um, so when this happened, of course, I felt, you know, that I was letting everyone down, that I was letting Sri Lanka down, the Federation in Sri Lanka, all the people that have helped me so much and my sponsors and my team, um, because I, I didn't know better, you know, and, and to have that cleared out now, it's not about the Olympics actually per se anymore. It's about, you know, showing to everyone that that they you know I, I wasn't letting them down I didn't do anything wrong and um, this is how life goes sometimes um, it's up and downs and we managed even this issue to get this done and I think we came out stronger you know we are wiser we are stronger we know I know now who is my people who is my friends who believed in me, who was stood by me when it was not the nicest time of my life. <laughs> Matila, we spoke about the Olympic issues, the qualification issues that you faced. What type of a support did you get it uh, get from the Sri Lankan authorities in regards to this? Honestly, everyone had been amazing. I couldn't hope for more support. Never, ever, ever did I get the feeling that I doubted that like the Federation in Sri Lanka or so Anish Primedaza, the president of the uh, Question Association, um, that he he never once did he believe that I did something wrong. He was so helpful. He was pushing for everything he everything he could have done. He did uh, for us to get this this right. And um, from the very start, I have had the best, best support from Sri Lanka. And also, you know, I, I received, not just now when again, it's good news. I, I received so many nice messages. I couldn't reply to everyone, but I'm just wanna take this time to just say thank you for everyone. It just warms my heart for every single message that I get. Um, even though I don't really always have the time to respond to everyone, you know, I do feel very blessed and happy that you do think of me. Uh, but also in the in, in the in the times where it was not good news and it was hard for all of us, people reached out from Sri Lanka and they were very supportive and they believed in me and that we would get this we would get these things done. And um, you know, there's things that you remember in the end of the day. You know, who stood by you and who supported you and who let you down. Uh, at which point of time that you decided you wanted to be a show jumper and uh, go professional? Um, well, you know. In, Let's start from the beginning. <laughs> um, in Sweden, every little girl pretty much goes to the riding school. It's not really because of the horses. It's more like a social thing. You know, you, all your friends from school, they go and they meet there in the afternoon and you ride a little bit and you brush the horses and the ponies. Um, most of the people that was with me in the rest, you know, they went to school, university, they had a, they found a boyfriend, they got other interests, so they dropped off. And, but I, I fell in love with the horses and, you know, I knew from the very first beginning, I guess, that that was gonna be a very big part of my life. I didn't, I never expected that I would be where I am today. And that kind of came, you know, from one thing to another led, to that I said, okay, I'm, I'm gonna go professional. I always been riding, I always loved the horses. All my spare time that I had growing up, I spent in the stables, um, all summer holidays, weekends, afternoons, I, I did my homework and then I went on the bike and I went to the stable. So um, 
And then when I was finished with my studies, I decided to go to Germany because Germany is the main country of show jumping. I mean, that's just the mecca of, of uh, horses. So I decided to go there to stay for a year or maybe two to learn the language a little bit, to have fun and, and yeah. And then uh, 18 years later, I'm still living in Germany and that's my home now. I mean, uh, I have this really nice, beautiful, big stable with my partner and and um, but okay, even when I went to Germany and I stayed, I said, okay, I gotta, I found my partners that is involved with the horses. Um, it wasn't, you know, I never thought I would go to the Olympics. I never thought I would be an international top rider. I never thought I would belong to the best riders in the world. I think it was about 2017. So it's, I mean, it's quite recent, actually. You know, I've been riding on and, I mean, I've been riding all the time, but I'm competing on and off on a top level, but never consistent. And, you know, I, I think every athlete is full of self-doubt. So even today, I think sometimes, you know, oh, do I really, am I good enough? <laughs> you know, um, but that's just the way life is, I guess. And that's what, that's what the beauty of, of sport in general, that every week you have a new competition, you need to, you can try again. If you fail, you go again and you try to win the next competition. When you are this kind of person that always want to push yourself, you want to be better, you want to raise the bar all the time to see where you can go. It just felt natural for me to, okay, started going pro and going to big international shows. And then I was so blessed to have so many nice people around me, supporting me, buying horses, um, you know, that when I reached this level where it was even thinkable for me to, yeah, to try to qualify for an event like Olympics, they said to me, you know, why, why, why can't you do it? Of course you can do it. We were gonna support you as much as we can. Um, you've been working hard your whole life. This is, we, let's do a try and, and we cannot more than fail. And then we try for our next Olympics, you know? And, and um, so it just came natural. And now I also have this horse, you know, that's, that's the thing with a question. It's not just me. Uh, I, I have a very special partner, which is Chopin, my horse. He, um, you know, I, I have had, a lot of horses in my life. I've been riding a lot of different horses, but to have a horse like him is honestly, it's a once in a lifetime horse that um, when you have a horse like this, you just have to go for it. You need to work extra hard. You need to try even more and you need to do everything you can in your power to get there because it's not gonna happen very often that I will have a horse like him. You spoke about things that are kind of you know, in line with challenges. If you are a, an athlete who is competing at a 100 meter race, everything is within your control. But when it comes to an equestrian, you've got to do everything with your partner, the horse. How challenging is it to make sure that your horse is kind of in line with your thought process? Oh my God, I cannot tell you how challenging that can be sometimes. I mean, the main thing is to keep him sound um, or the general of my horses. I am very blessed that I know my horse very, very well. He was born at my place. I have had him for 12 years. I have seen him grow from a little fall um, into this amazing, one of the best horses in the world. I mean, I cannot say how proud I am of him. And that, of course, makes it much easier for me because, I mean, I walk into the stable and he he doesn't see me. I think he just smells my smell and he starts wearing, you know, like he, we have this kind of connection and I, I can see in his eyes when he's feeling tired, when he's feeling, when something is wrong, you know, sometimes even veterinarians can't tell that something is wrong with him, but I know. And, you know, that's, that's the thing. The main thing is to keep him sound and happy. He cannot speak in words to me. So it's very important to me to have all my senses open so that I, we can, 
you know, connect and I can, he can kind of let me know what's going on, what he doesn't like, what he's afraid of, uh, what he prefers, you know, he's a horse that actually he loves attention. So he needs, now in Corona times, it's been a little bit difficult because we don't, we didn't have so many shows and he, the, there's no public. So he loves, he is his best himself when he comes into arena and people screams his name and he's, you know, they're like sharing, it's really loud. A lot of horses get scared and they get intimidated. He just like, he grows and he gets like, oh my God, I love this. And then he jumps even better. Uh, and I know this, you know, so I need to sh choose my shows. Other horses that I have had or still have in the butt, um, they, they prefer when it's quiet, when it's not so much attention going on. But with him, as many cameras as possible, he just loves it. <laughs> I, b I believe it's a, it's a very simple understanding that it is extremely important to have a very good relationship uh, with your horse. Mm -hmm. And I saw a video of you feeding your horse early in the morning with a lot of care. And uh, I got to know that you have a breeding farm of horses as well. How many horses uh, do yeah. you own, Matilda? Well, I have an amazing partner. His name is Manfred von Alverden. Um, that we created this stable together. He's a big breeder. He loves, he's not a rider, but he breeds the horses. And he have a crazy passion for horses. So he breeds about 200 foals every year. So it's a big, big stable with a lot of, baby falls right now coming out into the world. I mean, I couldn't be here without my amazing team. It's uh, so many people around me that have made this possible. And of course, it's my partner for the horses, which is Manfred van Alverden. And then it's Jan Reinecke. I think some of you people maybe saw him because he was with me in Sri Lanka two times. Uh, he's my fiance and he, uh, of course, is also the half owner of Chopin, he secured this horse for me when he was only seven years old. He said, I will, I'm, I will, I will, if you know that this is going to be your Olympic horse, I'm going to secure it for you and I'm going to buy the half. And he did. And of course, that was um, a big moment. <laughs> and uh, then it's my groom, Nikki, who has been with me for many, many years. He has been taking the best care of of Chopin, he had been traveling all over the world with, with me in Japan and he keeps up with the, all the crazy stuff that we wanna do. And, you know, he always, he, he goes out of the way to make me feel the best and uh, to take the best care of my horses. Of course, my trainers, Marcus and Meredith, and of course, Silva Söderstrand, who was my trainer during the qualification year, I switched um, last year to Marcus and Mary just to take it to the next level because they have a lot of experience. And I mean, Meredith was the only female number one in the world. Uh, so, and she's, you know, she's unbelievable uh, just to have her around with her experience. Um, then it's the whole team with the vets, my vet, Ugo, Cedric, who's the physio. Um, and, uh, and then it's all the people behind me, like my PR and, and my mom and my, my friends and family, you know, when it goes, it's always easy to have a good mood and be smiling and all when everything goes well. Um, but it's times, you know, when you're struggling and you don't know um, to get the power to continue, then it's so important to have surrounded you with the people that believes in you and, and just to know how to, <laughs> you know, keep the motivation up. So whenever you go for competitions and all, how many people travel with you, Matilda? Um, I mean, my groom is always with me, always. I don't go to it. I mean, I couldn't, I can't do it without him. Uh, my trainers comes sometimes. They are, of course, very busy at home. I mean, I go to them for training. I bet they are like, now it's also difficult with the uh, restriction because of Corona, I cannot bring too many people. My physio is always with me. Um, and of course, the horse owners, um, they come when the possibilities is there. Now it's very limited, unfortunately. But otherwise, you know, I also, I really like having people around me. I, I really, I think that's why me and Chopin come along so well, because we both like the attention and uh, like to have people around us, have a good spirit and yeah.
So talking about uh, the coaches who basically train you, Matilda, uh, when you talk about football or rugby or cricket uh, from a Sri Lankan perspective, I do understand exactly uh, what is the coaching process. But when it comes to a particular sport like show jumping, I do not understand exactly what's the role of a coach. Uh, and obviously the coach has to coach you as an individual and, the, and coach or the train uh, the horse as well. Uh, how does this particular exactly. process happen? I mean, most most of the trainers, not all, but most of the trainers have been very good riders themselves or are very good riders themselves. So they know how to train your horse. They help you to train your horse, but they also train you. But I think the most important, I switch trainers. I love training with Silva, who was my is this, this Swedish trainer that I had before. Uh, because he gave me the confidence that I needed to take myself to the next level. He always believed in me. He always thought that I could do everything, you know, and that is what I needed at that point. But in the end, I felt like I needed to switch to reach an even higher level. You know, I'm always that kind of person. I want to push myself. I want to see where I can go. And uh, the switch to Marcus and Meredith, Marcus Bierbaum, um was very important to me because you know they they have, both of them have been champions olympic champions world champions european champions um they are they know what you need to go to olympics and they know how to prepare you they know how to make my horse the best possible but i think the most important in trainers is not to try to change you just to bring out the best of you you know everyone have different styles everyone have different qualities but what makes a good trainer is to see what what you can bring to the game and bring that out and not try to change stuff because you know we are who we are um some needs to get you know level down and some need to be pushed and some need to train on having the motivation up and some people need to you know so it's just um, about finding the right middle. <laughs> what type of challenges uh, did you face with your horse uh, being like, you know, not cooperative enough? So from the qualification year um, was 2019. And my, we started out very well. Um, my horse did very good. He's a strong horse. He's a sound horse. And I was on the top of the ranking, you know, top two, kind of the whole year except uh, when he got sick in Lyme disease. It wasn't that he was sick that I couldn't, you know, he was sick for maybe a month. And I realized, because I know him very well, something is wrong. And it's very difficult to find this because it goes up and down. Um, and just because you take the test, it doesn't need, you can be positive, but it can still say negative. So it was, we had to take three tests because I was sure something is wrong with his nerves and his system. Um, and then he got medication and we, we treated him, but he, um, because of the medication, I wasn't allowed to show him on the competition because of the doping stuff and st things. So I dropped on the ranking and of course it's frustrating, you know, when you know you can do it, but my partner, I need him and he is not doing well. You know, it's, and I only had a couple of weeks, a couple of shows to to get this done and I needed to get him sound. But, you know, to ride him when he's not feeling well will, will maybe harm us so that he can never show again. And that I would never take that risk. So I needed to give him the time that he needed to be fully recovered. And uh, that was, of course, oh, pressure and, and, and whew, you know, you, yeah, you just feel... Uh, helpless in that time. Could you have used another horse uh, instead of uh, the horse yeah. that you were riding on? Yeah, um, that's what I did. I tried to qualify them with Apollonia instead, but Apollonia, she's now 17. Uh, she was um, already 15 at that time. I knew that she would be too old to do the Olympics. I mean, she, she had done so much for me. She had jumped so much in her life that it wouldn't be fair to take her to the Olympics, but I thought maybe I could try to qualify with her. I wasn't far off, uh, but luckily Chopin did get sound quicker than I expected, actually. 
and he could uh, he could do the qualification. I could have actually qualified. I, I probably would have qualified with her as well, but uh, it would have been more difficult. Uh, based on the answers for the series of questions uh, that I kind of, you know, shot across you, I'm convinced uh, that uh, equestrian sport is a rich man's sport and uh, it's very tough for uh, people in Sri Lanka to afford. Uh, who is actually funding uh, you, Matilda? Uh, it's, it is right. It is a very, it's a very hard sport because you need a lot of foundings and it is, I mean, it's hard to say. But that is just the fact that the cost to travel with the horses and doing this is very high, but it's not impossible. I mean, um, I was very blessed. I couldn't have done this alone, for sure not. I was very blessed to meet good people that have the same passion about horses and sport like I have. And they, you know, they enjoyed spending time with me and um, pursue this dream together with me and I have to say you know um, it would have been impossible for me to do it without these great people behind me um, but as a you know as a reaction of that you know everything is possible it doesn't matter where you come from or what you um, what country or if you have the financial possibilities or not if you work hard people will acknowledge you and they will see what you do. They will see your talent. They will see what you bring to the game. And um, you know, there will there are people out there that is willing to help you. So um, it's not. I wouldn't say that just because you wasn't born with money or you doesn't have financial strong opportunities is always a way. When you talk about sports in Sri Lanka, most of the sports uh, in uh, in the world, uh, when you grow older your form basically goes down. Uh, is it the same case uh, with an equestrian? Yeah, I think equestrian is kind of a sport where you can continue pretty for quite long. I mean, we have enough athletes that is like about 60 years old. They have been competing since they were teenagers in the higher sport. So it's a, you can have a very long career for sure. And that I'm very happy about that because I don't see myself stop riding for a while. <laughs> I had this particular alarming question with me, Matilda, when I kind of did my research uh, prior to this particular interview. Uh, your horses are basically accustomed to a certain climate. Uh, you spoke about you uh, living in Germany and your horse will be in Germany. And when you have a competition in China or Doha, then obviously the weather conditions will be different. How challenging is it? Um, I think by experience that it's more challenging for me than it is for my horses. I mean, they are amazing how they cope with all this. They're amazing how they cope with the time difference. You know, I, I, I sometimes when, you know, we go from Mexico to Shanghai and I don't know what day it is. I don't know how late it is. I, I'm like a zombie. I don't know anything. And my horses are like, you know, as soon as the sun goes up, they know it's a new day. And when the sun goes down, it doesn't matter for them, I mean, they just cope with it so much better. And okay, I'm based in Hamburg, Germany, which is kind of a cold city, you know, if you compare to yeah, Sri Lanka, it's always kind of, it's always colder and it's uh, kind of a rainy city. So it's, it's beautiful in there, in there, in, in, in a one way, it's very beautiful. Uh, but horses in general, I think they like, warmer weather because it's just nice for the body we know that as people as well that uh you know the, the warm weather is just nice for the muscles and the joints it just kind of makes us feel a little bit more movable uh so i don't mind the heat on my horses it's just i think in tokyo it's going to be a challenge because the humidity would be very high and i don't really know how he's going to cope with that he's a big horse a black a dark horse a black horse which also with the sun is it is you know it kind of is a little more heavy on him um but you know we have been we have been around the world together and he have never had any problems before so i just you know when when the time comes i'm gonna try to help him as much as possible excellent uh, you spoke about that you were with a horse uh, shopping, right? Is that right? Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, you, you said that, you know, you've been with your horse shopping all around the world. Uh, what is the biggest competition that you two have taken part up until this point of time? Uh, I, I mean, for sure, it was Global Champions Lee, uh, Global Champions Tour final in Doha. That was massive. It was really big. And also Mexico was very, very big. It is a fantastic show. And it's just like this kind of Mexican, I mean, Chopin loved Mexico. There was thousands, thousands of people screaming his name, coming into this beautiful arena with a lot of colors, music, you know. I love Mexican culture as well, because, you know, people are happy, they're singing, they, it's loud music, all these colors. Um, and he just, I mean, he jumped his heart out. I'm sure all of us virtually will be cheering for Chopin and you, Matilda, when you take part <laughs> in the Olympic Games in 2021 in Tokyo. Uh, uh, what is the most prestigious uh, competition when it comes to equestrian in the world? Well, for sure, it's, um, it's the Olympics. But in yet, I mean, Olympics and all the championships, uh, there is no event like the Olympics, for sure not. I mean, not just show by jumping wise i think for athletes in general you know world championship that's almost the same kind of you know it's the same people you see every week it's just the thing but i think i never been to olympics so this is going to be my first one of course obviously but i think just be surrounded by the best athletes in the world you know just to see this and have this spirit around you with all these amazing athletes and what they you know they just I think that's that's just something gonna be very different, <laughs> and uh, I mean also the Global Champions Tour and the Global Champions League that I have been taking part of the last couple of years is a very prestigious and very important tour um, with, of course, a lot of prize money. But also, you know, you need to be on top of your game. It's like kind of a championship every week. Um, if you can jump that consistently, that's what my thought have always been then you're ready to go and jump any other championship. <laughs> uh, my understanding in terms of uh, show jumping as an event is the person who makes the least amount of mistakes is uh, judged as the winner. Uh, is that right? Kind of. And you need to be fast as well. <laughs> yeah. uh, can you briefly explain me what is your study in terms of uh, rankings as an equestrian? I'm, I'm not very focused on rankings, to be honest. Um, I always compete against myself I I want to do good I want to perform in a way that I can be proud of myself and my horses I'm I I am not the most I'm as I said we are not the fastest couple and I don't win too many classes but it's only one winner every week so it's I mean that doesn't mean much I, for me the most important is to always perform the very best I want to go clear I want to be placed i want to be as best as i can that i am not the fastest rider and my horse is maybe not the fastest horse we know that but i mean what we have achieved already is is amazing so um i think it's just stick to your plan be true to yourself i'm not you know the ranking was very important of obviously in the qualification year 2019 i had then but then it was the olympic ranking not the world ranking the olympic ranking was of course very important to me because that decides who's going to qualify. So I had, I mean, I was on this ranking, checking it out every day. You know, who, who is my competition? Who are, where are the other riders riding? Are they gaining points? And where am I going to gain points? You know, it was actually now afterwards, it was a very exciting year because it was, um, you know, you were always up and down and you check out all your competition, which... Actually, a lot of these competition, the other people riding and trying to get the spots, they're very good friends of mine. You know, it's, I know it's a lot of, you know, everyone wants these spots and, um, you know, we fight very hard for it, but we also like hanging out and enjoy the time together. When we talk about Matilda, the training routine of uh, US, how many uh, hours or what type of uh, time period, what amount of time period do you spend with your horse on a day and individually as an athlete? Um, well, you know, the question spot is like, you know, you, you never really go home and then, you know, have a normal life. Because, <laughs> 
you're always on top of everything. And, and I think, you know, even if I'm not in the stable, it's a lot of things that needs to be done. But um, I, I train, okay, I don't, I train Chopin maybe an hour a day. And then my groom takes him out many times uh, more during the day. And he goes on the fields, on the paddocks, and he enjoys himself when he's home. Uh, but then it's me, <laughs> you know, I'm really small. Um, and I don't really have um, the advantage of being tall and strong. So I need to put a lot of hours into the fitness and to the gym. To I don't I don't think you have to be a you know you don't need to ride with strength. I think you can ride with feeling and with with the discipline. You know, you just to have your horses sensitive enough, and that that works very good for me. But of course, I feel a disadvantage. You know, these horses are six, seven, eight hundred kilos. You know. And uh, sometimes, maybe not with Chopin all the time, but with other horses, sometimes I feel disadvantaged because I'm just not, you know, physically strong enough. Um, and I need to stay in shape and to try to, you know, I have this amazing horse now and I shouldn't, I shouldn't, it shouldn't be on me why we could not perform as good as we can. When you talk about pressure levels, Mathilda, for an athlete, I'm very sure that your horse will not have any pressure when it goes to a competition, but definitely you will have. Um, I mean, my horse, actually, you know, he doesn't feel much pressure because he's a very relaxed type. He's very confident and he just loves pressure, you know, like, and, but other horses do feel pressure and they do feel sensitive. He is not that kind of type, but I just like people, horses are different. I have horses that, you know, you need to really focus on and that they don't feel the pressure. Me, I kind of, of course, it needs to be in a good way, but I kind of race from pressure. I need this as well. I need to, when I'm too relaxed, it's not good. I, I know I perform the best when I know, Oof, how are we going to do this? You know, when I feel like, oh God, this is, this is big and this is on top, really top of my game now then I perform the best. I, my weakness is the concentration that I, that I can focus enough to not let, you know, it's a lot of things around. It's always a lot of media, people wanting something from you. And, and also, you know, you, it's normal that you also have personal issues sometimes, you know, and, and um, that kind of, I, that's my thing that I always need to work on a lot, not to let that across me, you know, and, um, but the pressure, yeah, of course we feel pressure. We want to do the, but never do you ride into the ring and you think today I'm going to have a bad round. You never think that, you know, it's never with purpose. You go in and you want to do the best you can. Sometimes it doesn't, things happen and sometimes it doesn't go your way. But the, the, not, the coolest thing with our sport is, you know, we pack together and we go to a different show. Next week is a new week. You sleep one night, you wake up, it's a new day and you just continue. And then, you know, if you, if you let that come to you, that would drag you down. But if you can just drop it behind you and you say, okay, shit happens. We're gonna um, be better next week. You, it is always a new opportunity for you. You're always there to, you can always make it better. Talking about from this part of the world, Matilda, now academics are given more prominence than sport in this part of the world. Uh, how was it uh, when you grew up? Well, you know, they were, they are not horse people at all. So they could not understand why I wanted to spend all my time in the stable brushing horses and just, you know, they did not understand that. And for them, it you know, um, education is the most important. And I do believe, you know, being smart and being educated would take you a long way. You know, you everything else is a bonus, but that is something that every person should try. I really, I really do believe that every person should have the right to get good education and to go to school and and uh, to study. And that comes first. And they always said, okay, you know, we're going to have you go to Germany for two years and then you come back and you do something, you know, normal or something real. <laughs> but I think in the end of the day now, uh, 
you know, my mom is my biggest support and my biggest fan. And even though she don't really understand why I need to do what I do, <laughs> she's very proud. And obviously she knew that uh, I choose the right way. So moving on to the Olympic uh, goals, uh, Matilda, a lot of people from Sri Lanka have taken part in uh, Olympic Games, but uh, we have only two medals up until this point of time. Uh, one, was okay. by Duncan, oh. one was by Duncan White, uh, where he clinched a silver medal that was back in way back in 1950s. And then uh, my memory oh, wow. during my lifetime. Uh, a medal was won by Susantika Jayasinghe. She won a silver medal. Those are the only two medals that we have. And Susantika is, uh, is the only person during my lifetime I had the privilege of seeing winning, a, uh, winning an Olympic medal. And then <clears throat> I've been like, you know, focusing on the rankings of you in terms of uh, all the show jumping events. And I kind of fell in love with the event, you know, based on the way that the horses are doing things and even the dressage is so amazing, you know, a horse is basically dancing to a Hollywood song is just, just beyond my imagination. And uh, we are so excited to see you taking part uh, in the Olympic Games in Tokyo 2021. Um, what, is the, what is the realistic goal? What, what have you set uh, yourself as a goal, Matilda, to achieve at the Olympics in year 2021? Um, well, for me, the goal is definitely to take myself to the final and everything else is a bonus. I think, you know, I know my horse and I know my strengths and I know um, my team and what we are sh uh, capable of. I, I really, I wouldn't go if I didn't think that we, can, we actually have a proper chance. I mean, the final, to just reach the final is a, is a very important thing and I, that's the main goal. And everything from there is, um, I think, uh, is a bonus. And I mean, I would love to take a medal for sure. And everything is possible, but, you know, to be realistic, um, I would love to, but the final must be done. Obviously, we would love to see you basically gaining a medal and clinching a medal at the Olympics 2021. You'll be the third person to do so, Matilda. And we all are eagerly watching. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we basically want you to put your maximum effort yeah. and everything uh, for us to see you winning a medal for us. Um, beyond Olympics, what are your goals? Uh, what are your future aspirations, Matilda? Um, well, now when I have this amazing horse and many others, hopefully to come up, younger ones, um, there's a lot of nice things. That's what also I told myself when, um, when the Olympic wasn't really on, on the map anymore. Um, that we have the Asian Games coming up and uh, the World Championship next year. So I really hope that it's going to be a lot of events uh, where we will see this Rolankian flags in the future, for sure. And of course, when you talk about uh, the rankings, qualifications for Olympics, uh, the Australians or the East Asia and another continent is being kind of grouped as one, I believe, which means that uh, if you consider yeah. in Asia, from an Asian perspective, you would be ranked uh, under one or two. Is that right? Yeah, on the Olympic rankings, I'm number two. Yeah. And from a from an Asian perspective, if you take part in an Asian competition, a medal is a kind of a guaranteed thing, a gold, <laughs> isn't it? No, yeah, guarantee. It's never a guarantee. I wouldn't say that, but I do think Asian Games is gonna be a very interesting event for us to actually perform very very well. And thank you very much for answering the questions and. Uh, and, and your patience uh, and all of the Sri Lankans are looking forward to you taking part at the Tokyo Olympics in 2021 <laughs> and we all are gonna basically support uh, Matilda Carlson and of course uh, uh, Chopin uh, at the 2021 Tokyo <laughs> Olympics and uh, thank you very much for accepting my invitation Matilda and it was, yeah, it was thank you so pleasure. much for having me thank you so much thank you and uh, we cannot wait to host you uh, when you come back to Sri Lanka and we wish you all the best and good luck on your future All right, thank yeah. you. I thank hope you. Soon. As soon as these restrictions goes away, I will, I will find a way to come. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Matilda, one more time. Uh,